Hello, I'm Dr. Satish Rao from Augusta University. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you. It is an honor to speak in Nancy Norton's uh, celebration symposium. Nancy is a very good friend and has been a tireless worker for patients with bowel disorders and functional bowel disorders and fecal incontinence. So it is indeed an honor to join all my colleagues to honor this distinguished colleague. The title of my presentation is Current and Novel Treatment Options for Pelvic Floor Disorders. These are some of my disclosures. The objectives for my talk are to discuss with you what is the pelvic floor, what are the common pelvic floor disorders, and discuss advances in the evaluation, diagnostic workup, and treatment of two common pelvic floor problems, constipation with dyssynergic defecation and fecal incontinence. Now, this is the pelvic floor, all right? What do we mean by the pelvic floor? Well, this bone or the hip bone is called the pelvis, and the structures that are housed inside the bone is what we call as pelvic floor structures. And problems that arise from this pelvic floor structures lead to pelvic floor disorders. Now, if you stand up a person and look at the individual sideways and you really do a section, this is how the anatomy looks. Here is the front, here is the back. This is the little bit of the backbone or the sacrum bone. And if you go from front to back, this is the pubic bone. The first organ in the front is the urinary bladder. The next organ in a lady, you have a uterus and the vagina and the vaginal opening. The third organ is really the rectum and the anus opening, and behind it are the bony structures. These are the principal components of the pelvic floor. What is its function? Well, the pelvic floor is an important organ in itself and performs a number of functions. First of all, with regards to bladder and bowel control. It facilitates passage of urine and stool. It is an important organ for sexual function, an important organ for breathing because it's part of the diaphragmatic breathing process and a very important organ for pregnancy and childbirth. Therefore, a multiple key functions are performed by the pelvic floor. Now, what are the very common pelvic floor disorders? We have a number of disorders that are part and parcel of the pelvic floor. For example, a person with stool leakage, otherwise called fecal incontinence, a person with difficulty with evacuation or bowel movement, also called dyssynergic or incoordinate defecation, patients with anal pain caused by a fissure, patients with a condition called solitary rectal ulcer syndrome, where they have an ulcer in the rectum and they bleed and excessively strain. There is pelvic pain, there is rectal prolapse, there is rectocele, which is like a small uh, 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 protrusion in the front of the rectal wall. There is excessive movement of the perineal muscles on the wall so that there is weakness and descent. There is anorectal pain, also called levate ani syndrome of proptalgia fugax, and there are hemorrhoids. Some of these, some of you may already know, some of these, some of you may not know, but this is just a, a list of the very common pelvic floor disorders. But for time purposes here, we will only focus on the two important aspects, which are the more common and more difficult to manage and treat problems, which is constipation with dyssynergic defecation and stool leakage. So let's talk about constipation. A very common problem affects up to a quarter of elderly population, but about 15% of the younger population. More prevalent in women than men, it leads to about two and a half million physician visits per year, more than $1.4 billion of over-the-counter laxatives are consumed annually in the United States itself, not globally. Now let's talk something very important here. We as physicians, unfortunately, speak a language which is alien to our patients. And it is very important that physicians and patients connect with the right language so that we can understand our patients. Now, this is something that I've been teaching for the last 25 years and will continue to do so. But if you are a patient listening to this, please be patient and try and help to make your physician understand and make sure they truly understand your problem. Because many times people use certain terms that are misunderstood. Here, patients were asked a simple question, 
what is constipation? And you can see 27% of patients thought it was having a bowel movement every two days or less frequently. None of the physicians believed that was the case. Having a bowel movement three days or less often, 25% of patients felt this was so about a quarter of the physicians believed. But look at this. Having a bowel movement every four days or less often was reported by 13% of the patients, but almost half the physicians believed that this was their definition of constipation. Look how disconnected we are when compared to what our patients are reporting. Hard stools alone, quarter of the patients believe that's constipation. Only 6% of the physicians thought that was constipation. So there is a major disconnect between us physicians and you patients, and we need to connect better. And this really, the onus is more on the physicians, but I just want you to become aware of this. So today, how do we define constipation? We have now learned that constipation is not a one problem, one symptom, one mechanism disorder, but it is multiple symptoms. And we have six important symptoms that we now use. And if a patient has at least two of these symptoms for three months or more, then we say that the patient has constipation. The symptoms are number one, excessive straining, hard or lumpy stools, feeling of incomplete evacuation, a feeling of blockage, or use of physical digital maneuvers to disimpact or remove stool, or stool frequency of less than three bowel movements per week. Any two of these makes you constipated. Let's turn to this interesting case story. A 51-year-old school teacher came to see me with a five-year history of constipation. Began during college days, now bowels move once every one to two weeks. So severe constipation, hard stools, pellet-like stools, only after fleet's enema, suppository and laxatives. She uses digital maneuvers and describes excessive straining, a feeling of incomplete evacuation, and occasional bleeding. She tried a number of over-the-counter laxatives, including prescription laxatives such as linaclotide and uh, Miralax or PEG. None of them gave relief. Now, this is a very classical presentation of a patient with dyssynergic defecation. So when I see patients like this, we use a number of tools to actually help. First is really take a good history, just like I've given you, then try and perform a careful, meticulous digital rectal examination. I know many of you are shy of this kind of examination, but this really informs us significantly about some of the mechanics that people may be using. And then we use various tools to confirm the abnormalities we pick up in the rectal examination. And one thing that we've, what we've also learned recently is there is a disconnect, as I just shared with you, between patients' history, that they provide and the physician's ability to extract the history from the patient. One way to bridge this gap is by using prospective stool diaries, or more recently, we have developed with the help of a company some apps. Here is an app for constipation, and here's an app for fecal incontinence that patients can keep. These are just like 10 to 12 questions. It takes about two minutes to complete the app, and this kind of an app record will provide a accurate recording of bowel symptoms removes any bias and provides a very good way of understanding the patient's problem. So I would encourage all of you to use it. With regards to testing, we have a number of tools. Anorectal manometry, we put a probe in the rectum with pressure sensors, endosonography is an ultrasound test, nerve function test, and a balloon expulsion test, etc. These tests can be very useful in really providing us with accurate information. Here are some of the various screens on the app. For example, stool consistency on a Bristol scale. Did you have a bowel movement? Did you strain? Did you have to use finger stress as tooling? And you just have to answer yes or no, and you can generate a table and a report at the end of it. We also compared in a scientific study how good is the app and also looked at its functionality. Suffice to say that the app compared very favorably with the paper, and about 58% of patients preferred the app to the paper form of diary. So when we look at patients with constipation, we broadly categorize them into three common groups. IBS with constipation where pain or bloating is an important feature along with altered bowel habit. Slow transit means the colon has become lazy, not able to move stool. Evacuation disorders, multiple disorders, but dyssynergic defecation is the key where the act of moving stool out of the rectum has become incoordinated, leading to difficulty with evacuation. If you identify dyssynergy, a common pelvic floor disorder, what can you do? Well, the best treatment is what we call as biofeedback therapy, a technique of conditioning and retraining the mind and the body, particularly the body, to normalize bowel movement. And these are the principles of biofeedback therapy. First, we teach them diaphragmatic breathing exercises. 
Then we teach them posture and how to relax the pelvic floor. If patients have impaired sensation, we improve this by sensory uh, training, eliminate sensory delay, and lastly, we provide simulated stools to facilitate expulsion of this in the laboratory. This kind of a teaching session takes approximately one hour, and we do this once a week or once every other week, and usually 70% of patients are successful in correcting their abnormal behavior. The patient I just described to you had classic uh, dyssynergia, and after five sessions of training, now she can generate a good push, push and then nicely relax in the anal canal, showing normal coordinated defecation. And that is the way I would normally manage a case with dyssynergic defecation. Let me switch gears and talk about another case. A 42-year-old lady, Gravida 3, Para 2, first developed fecal incontinence two months after first delivery, had her second baby, and then this uh, leakage became worse. Now, when she's come to see me, she reports two bowel movements a day and about four to eight leakage events per week for the past 10 years. She can sense the stool coming out, sadly cannot stop it. Sometimes she's walking in a store and this happens and this is really very embarrassing. Also has leakage of gas, no urinary incontinence, a back injury. She has some hypothyroidism. She tried taking psyllium as advised by her doctor, shy taking antidiarrheal such as loperamide. They have not afforded any relief. So what can you do for this patient like this? Now, fecal incontinence is a devastating, embarrassing, a uh, uh, problem that affects 14% of the American population. A very recent study of serving 71,000 Americans, one in seven American suffers with this problem. It is slightly more common in women and significantly more common in older age individuals. So why do people develop this and what are the predisposing factors? Now, if we have urgency and diarrhea, all of us are potentially at a threat of developing stool leakage. Fortunately, we are not. But in a FI patient, this can be a problem. As we age, our muscles and nerves age and potentially predispose us to us. But one of the important factors, which was also a cause in the patient that I just described, was obstetric injury, unfortunately caused by use of forceps during the birth of baby. This somewhat traumatic uh, uh, of delivery causes significant damage to the pelvic floor, including muscle and nerve damage. And in this case, there was damage to the muscle that was torn leading to this. Patients who unfortunately have a spinal cord injury where the nerves have been compromised, although they may recover from the injury, the nerve damage may persist, giving rise to both urinary and stool incontinence. Older patients and sometimes young kids also, there is significant retention of stool. It's called fecal impaction. And then there is overflow leakage, which is another common reason. But what I think is the most important message here is fecal incontinence is rarely caused by one mechanism. In 80% of patients that we have studied, we've shown more than one mechanism, such as muscle being torn or nerve being damaged or rectum not able to sense or rectum is too sensitive or there is inability of the rectum to hold stools. Rectum is a res reservoir for stool and can expand itself. But if that expansile ability is compromised, then unfortunately patient can have leakage. Clinically, we subdivide them into three types, passive means, like this lady, you know, walking in a store cannot sense stool and it's leaking. Or you have an urge to go, but you can't make it to the restroom, urge incontinence. Or you have a normal evacuation and then you feel some wetness, and that is because small amount of stool has seeped. And these are have different mechanisms, and that is what physicians will be interested in finding out and treating. Again, in terms of evaluating them, we talked about the constipation app. Here is the FI app, which also asks if you've had a leakage, how, how much of leakage you had, and so on. And this can be very useful in documenting the story. Manometrically, when this is a healthy manometry. You can see when the person squeezes, very nice red here. Whereas in a patient with stool leakage, there's a big gap because the muscle is torn and defective. Ultrasound, intact muscle here. And here you can see, instead of being like a, right, like a round, it is a crescent because the muscle is torn in the upper part. Some new tests that we've developed are for studying nerve function non-invasively. We can now apply a magnetic coil to the lumbar region or the sacral region, and then we can use a neurophysiology recorder and a magnetic stimulation device to nicely study the neurological function. Here is an example of a healthy individual with normal conduction and a patient with 
uh, fecal incontinence having very prolonged conduction of the nerve function. In terms of treatment of stool leakage, well, fiber supplementation and antidiarrheals can be helpful in about 15 to 20 percent of patients along with Kegel exercises. But in the vast majority of patients, this is not successful and they will need specific therapy. One of the most effective specific therapies is biofeedback therapy, where we teach the patient to strengthen the anal sphincter muscle, improve sensation, and improve coordination, and those with dyssynergia to correct that. Here is an example. So here is a patient. We ask the patient to squeeze. Here is the muscle pressure from 0 to 100 millimeters. You can see that the person can squeeze up to 80, but only lasts for one or two seconds. It drops a very weak squeeze. After five sessions, now the same person, very good squeeze up to 100 and sustain the squeeze. This is what we can achieve with biofeedback therapy. In addition to this, there are some other more surgical procedures. Dextranomer injection is an injection which is inserted just into the anal canal. Uh, it forms like a nice buffer and forms a protective coat inside the anal region. Surgeons will do sphincteroplasty. If the muscle is torn, then you can bring the muscle edges together and suture it up. And there is sacral nerve stimulation, which is like a pacemaker to the sacral nerves which stimulates the muscles and improves stool incontinence. And in some selected cases, we may have to do a bag or a colostomy, especially in those with spinal cord injury, as this is problematic. There are some new devices, such as that has become available. We have just done a control study with this device, and we found this to be very effective. Lastly, I want to touch base on a brand new treatment called TNT, or Translumbosacral Neuromodulation Therapy. We've identified that 70% or more patients with stool leakage have nerve damage. Therefore, in these patients, we can apply a simple magnetic coil in four regions in the back, as you illustrated in this patient, and this magnetic energy flows and stimulates the nerves, and the nerves have a unique property called neuroplasticity. In other words, nerves have an ability to regenerate, regrow, and reconnect. So we capitalize on this property of the nerves. Very few parts of a body can do this, but nerves can do it. And that leads to improved connectivity of the nerves, leading to improved function and improvement in stool leakage. Does it work? Yes. In our pilot study, which we reported last year, 91% of patients who received one hertz therapy improved, 36 and 55% in the other treatments. So in summary, my friends, first of all, thank you for listening. Pelvic floor disorders are very common. It affects 25% of population, as I mentioned. Detailed history, physical and digital rectal examination is important. Electronic stool diary and apps provide an accurate history and severity assessment. The two, com two most common problems, dyssynergic defecation, is very common, missed by most physicians. So it is important to bring this to your doctor's attention. Manometry, balloon expulsion tests provide accurate diagnosis. Biofeedback is the preferred treatment. And hopefully in the future, home biofeedback will revolutionize this treatment approach for many of us. Fecal incontinence, a multifactorial problem. There are wonderful diagnostic tools. Ideally, if you can understand the mechanism and tailor the treatment to the mechanism, that will lead to greater success in management of the patients, including lifestyle measures, antidiarrheals, biofeedback, selected cases, surgery or SNS, and novel treatments such as home biofeedback or translumbosacral neuromodulation therapy. I hope you found that very useful, and hopefully this will help you get better care, and good luck for all my patients. Thank you.